y'all are getting good at that part. Okay. So besides Heather, has anyone else played around with their Nearpod account? I've been uh, messing around with it today. It's really uh, cool. I, I saw that you can upload existing PowerPoint presentations into it, which is really cool because then I can just kind of build on some things that I already have, um, yeah. which is uh, comforting. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we do not have time to start from scratch. I, I don't think I've ever started much from scratch in, in my teaching. I look for a, an OER lesson or another idea somewhere. It is jumping on. Okay, so today we're going to talk about lesson strategies and tools for Nearpod. So we'll go through uh, some design strategy ideas, um, looking at data after the session, how to use that, um, some instructional strategies, look at um, planning and deploying your activities to students through Blackboard and for um, access through mobile devices, tablets, phones, and iPads. And then we'll create a quick lesson um, so you can see how that works. So in the chat box, would you please just uh, throw out some brainstorming? How might you be thinking about using Nearpod this fall? So which instructional strategies or learning objectives are you uh, working to meet using Nearpod? Okay, Heather, are you looking at um, during your live Zoom meeting or a live face-to-face -face meeting using your pod? I'm hoping to use it uh, during my live Zoom meetings. Um, okay. So when I'm creating this first one, I've been trying to think about how I'm going to be on Zoom working like through the Nearpod with them and, and delivering content in that way. I would suggest uh, that all of your students, instead of going through Blackboard to access it, um, do that on their phone. Sure. Like, to do the Nearpod on a second device. Um, so that his, what you, and you know from teaching, once you get some, a couple of things open on your screen, you're trying to manage a Zoom, things can just get lost. Um, you can kind of get just lost out there in space. So I would ask them to use their phone or a second device. And in that case, they're going to look, they're going to need to download the app if they use their cell or a tablet. And then um, the types of questions that you'll want to create or that you'll want to avoid are the draws. Anything with drawing is really challenging on the phone. Um, everything else works pretty good. You'll probably need to give them directions to uh, move the question out of the way. Uh, by uh, clicking that blue box with the white arrow head that moves the question up and down because it'll take up some of that real estate on the screen of the phone and cover up some of their um, answer space. Other than that, it should go pretty seamless for them. Let's see. Instructions for an assignment. That sounds great. Great way to make sure they understand your instructions. Polling. Vocabulary quizzes, yes. Yep, lots of low stakes. Sounds great. Yep, and both the matching and the quiz can be self-correcting. So those are great, great uses there. Okay, that helps a lot. All right, so I don't have a chat jockey in this session, so please feel free to just interrupt me um, it, anytime you have questions or want me to stop or slow down. Uh, one more housekeeping question. Uh, is anyone watching this and then working along on a second device? You can just type yes in the chat box. 
that'll help me know to not go too fast. And you don't have to be on a second device. Sometimes people towards the end want to have their hands on their Nearpod dashboard while they're watching. So if at any point I'm going too fast or too slow, just give me a shout. All right, so we'll look at the basic structure of a Nearpod lesson. And no matter what my um, objective is, my goal for my Nearpod, one of my goals for my Nearpods is to be brains on, hands on pretty much the whole time. So not, um, not giving them more than um, a couple of minutes of passive time inside the interactive lecture. Um, you do not have to upload any slides at all. You can create a straight question set um, for Nearpod. So there's lots of different ways to use it, but the main thing is keep them working every couple of minutes. So give them time to check out, uh, you know, during the video or anything like that and throw questions in there to keep them engaged. As students are working, um, this is gonna keep them accountable for their own learning. It's gonna help them develop critical thinking and metacognate around all of the ways that they're taking in the information. Uh, probably wanna remind them at the beginning of your first few Nearpods to, um, enable the note feature even if they don't want to uh, take any notes because that will give them all the materials. Uh, so now they've got a study materials set, unless for some reason you don't want them to have that stuff. But it's a great way to like help them build a set of their own resources that they can go back and study through um, to get ready for your lar larger stakes exams. And you're going to get tons of data along the way that'll help you correct their thinking as they're working so that um, by the time they get to those larger stakes exams, there's no surprises for anyone. Yay, here's Constance. So the, the basic lesson design is to create the lecture, insert interactivity triggers. Hi, Cam. Hi, Constance. And then the students submit the work. If you focus on building foundational knowledge, uh, the lower level of, of Bloom's taxonomy, um, that will free up your in-class lecture time to go through all the really meaty stuff. So I, you can throw critical thinking questions in here uh, as well, but um, if you like to have a lot of class time to get at that type of work, um, you can really leverage Nearpod to help build all that foundational understanding for your course. So it's, it's kind of a, a cycle that I use. I create all of my content, then I look for places to insert my prompts, my students engage, I affirm what they've done correctly, and then I correct what they haven't done correctly. A lot of times students don't know what they're doing right and they only focus on what they're doing wrong and they, they just don't even have an understanding of what skills they do have. So it's nice to, you know, in general, say most of the class is getting this information or call out certain students, you know, give particular feedback to let them know their pluses and their deltas in all their work. As you analyze your data, I encourage you to award for effort, not precision. I don't call it participation points with my students because that sounds kind of like a gimme, like I showed up, I did the thing, so I get full credit, right? No, nope. you have to put some effort into it. You have to put some thought into your responses. That's how you get credit. And again, take that data and then close the loop with the students with some feedback. You'll receive reports in two formats. And in the session material folder, there's a sample of those, all the reports that you can download. So you can get a, PS, a PDF or a CSV for your whole class and for individual students. And depending on how you're using the data, um, that will probably drive the type of report you want to download. I download the CSV report and then sort by participation percent so that I can enter uh, credit for everyone who's done 100%. And I see all of that really easily. The PDF is a little bit nicer presentation of everyone's responses. So I only use the CSB to see 
um, who's going to get credit for their effort. And then I go to the PDF and look at the actual responses that students give. Okay, let's look at some planning considerations. So students right now, a lot of students are in online environments that did not choose to be. They're nervous about it. They're not sure if, if they can even be organized or, you know, they haven't prepared themselves mentally. They don't have a lot of experience working online. Online classes take probably twice as much time as face-to-face -face classes with organizing the learning. Um, a lot of the things that we just say in class, um, you know, off the cuff and directions and questions we can answer really easily have to be addressed um, inside your uh, Blackboard course so that students understand exactly what to do. And I create redundancy in explanations and directions. So I tell them more than once in more than one way. So for example, you could create a short text um, document that explains it to them and then do a quick video as well um, that talks them through. Uh, students take in different, you know, everyone takes in information in different ways and for some people it resonates in text, some people it resonates in video. And clearly flesh out your expectations to students. Let them know exactly um, what the accountability structure is for this. Do you expect them to complete every question to receive uh, effort points? Will they receive effort points? Um, what are you grading them on? Are you grading them on the quality of their response, the length of their response? Um, or just any response they give, you'll give points for. Help them understand exactly um, what their criteria is. There, you can set your Nearpods to have an expiration date, but the student doesn't see that and the direct lesson link that integrates it with Blackboard doesn't show a due date. So you'll need to communicate that to students. And then also, um, will you accept late work? So if they don't do it on time, do they have a chance to make that up at some point? Think about how students will get to the lesson. In Blackboard, you can go to add content, scroll down to the bottom, and there's a direct lesson link method. I have a video um, uh, that's part of a longer video and I'm just going to create a short video that teases that part out and that will be in your uh, resources as well. I just need to wait for Blackboard to come back up on that. Um, but basically what happens is uh, you click that, go to add content, click direct lesson link in Blackboard. It opens up a separate tab with your Nearpod account. You click the lesson you want to add from that dashboard. It does some little magic and then it says, okay, your lesson is linked. Close this tab and then go refresh your Blackboard page to see the lesson. So you close that tab, go back to your Blackboard lesson, refresh the page, and then it appears as a link. What's nice about embedding that link for students is they just got one place to go. They go into Blackboard um, and it populates the lesson with their name. So just like it appears on Blackboard, which helps you find them faster in the grade book, especially at the beginning of the term before you get to know their names and you get to know them very well. If they join from a phone, an iPad, or a tablet, they'll need to use the app and a join code. So even if they go through Blackboard on their phone, it's still going to ask them to download the app. So that's a direction to give them Heather ahead of time so that they come to class with that app on their phone already and you're not spending time in class having everybody download it. I have a student direction sheet that uh, is in your um, resource folder that's editable. So you can add any directions you'd like to that. Um, but it'll give you a little starting point to help explain to students the difference between joining with a, an app versus joining on Black. And then we want to make sure that students understand the outcome of this. Um, nobody likes to do busy work. So share with students why this is activity is important to you and how they benefit. So help them understand, yeah, it's only worth a few points. It's a very low stakes activity. You're gonna have a ton of low stakes activities this term. They're all gonna add up. So 
doing them all will benefit you down the line. And you're also going to see the types of questions and the content that could be on your midterm or your final. So, you know, just help them understand how, you know, why to you this is important for, the, for you to have them do and what it's going to give them. Good so far? I can't wait till we're all back together in this single room and being able to do this. Okay, so my strategy uh, for creating Nearpods is I start out in PowerPoint and then any interactive slides that I wanna use in Nearpod, I build them over there. Um, I start in PowerPoint because PowerPoint has the online image library and I can pull in, it has a bigger bank of Creative Commons images that are fair use than um, seem to be connected inside Nearpod with the Google. So I start in PowerPoint, create my slides there, import them, and then add into Nearpod as I go. So I make my whole presentation without one question on there. I don't even think about the questions or any content triggers that I'm going to add. I just go ahead and build the presentation like I was gonna talk through it. Then I come back and look for places where it makes sense to add interactivity. One of, the, one of my strategies is at the very beginning of every lesson, I start with a collaborate so that everybody is, is getting to connect learner to learner from the very beginning. So that kind of kicks it off with some engagement and they're seeing each other's responses. It could be a check-in question or it could be um, a content question. Um, but I do like to start with something that gets them learner to learner connected from the very start. Um, Flipgrid is now integrated with Nearpod. So you could kick it off with a Flipgrid even and have them uh, be able to see and speak to each other from the very beginning. And then I come down and just start looking for opportunities to add content. So here I think, you know, so they did a collaborate, they go through a couple slides, I'd probably narrate this one, narrate this one, have them engage with content, and then maybe ask a question right after that. Or now that we can do videos uh, with questions, I would ask the questions inside the videos. So I break it up so that they are not passive for more that really, if you can break it up in five to 10 minute chunks, that's optimal. Um, keep them moving quickly from activity to activity and no downtime within here. I use the um, slide sorter view in PowerPoint. Uh, once I've got the whole thing built there, because then you can see um, like a, a nice layout of your whole presentation. And if you notice over here, this is just a blank slide and I just made a cue to myself, hey, collaborate would be cool here. Video would be cool down here. These are like a note to self. I will delete those off once I get to Nearpod, but it just helps me orient when I get over to Nearpod. So this might be a strategy that works for you. You can totally build the whole thing just in your Nearpod as well. Um, it helped me uh, at first to do this, um, though, just to give myself some cueing. Okay. Let's talk about some instructional strategies. So whenever I'm using any educational technology, I always think about what's my outcome, what's my purpose, and then I go look for a tool and a strategy that matches that outcome. That way I don't get lost chasing shiny things and I create aligned objectives, uh, aligned with all my content and my tools. So. I'm really big on everything fits together, everything's purposeful, um, and everything connects back to either um, a student learning objective for the course or a stu student learning objective to the module. So I always start with my purpose and then I bring in the tools for it. So here I wouldn't start with, oh, matching questions are really cool, what can I do with matching? Instead of thinking that way, I would think, oh, I've got some vocabulary that I need to build Matching is a great tool for that. Another really nice um, 
way to use the Flipgrid integration is to provide some touch points for your students. You um, can do icebreakers. You could have them do an icebreaker at the beginning of your first couple of near pods. You could have an introduction uh, like we've done in our online hybrid course. You could have them do discussions about content. So you could give them a reading a PDF to read and then do a discussion uh, after that in Flipgrid. And that would feel much different to them than doing the discussion over in the discussion board. So um, developing speaking and listening skills are important, um, just as important as their writing skills. So you can give them a balance of developing those different ways of communicating um, academically, learner to learner, um, by balancing the discussion board with the Flipgrid discussions. One of my favorite strategies that I use almost every single class I teach is an exit ticket. Um, when I'm face to face, I, um, and I taught math, so I'd give them a problem or you know, some kind of math task to do, some application. And then I, I would take the papers and sort them into three different piles. Didn't get it, kind of got it, really got it. And then I'd look at the size of my stacks to see where the distribution of understanding is and what I need to cover at the beginning of the next class. So in Nearpod, you could do the same thing. You could uh, pop up uh, the Nearpod code at the end of your synchronous lecture or just embed this into your asynchronous work and say, okay, everybody in this last 10 minutes of class, I'd like you to log in and do your exit ticket. And it's three to five questions that get at what you believe was the most important information from that session. So, what did you, if, if they don't remember anything else, they don't take anything else away from today, what do you want to make sure they know? That's what goes on the exit ticket. And um, have them submit that, and then you can use the CSV file or skim through their responses on the um, uh, PDF to, to do like a, a sort of didn't get it, kind of got it, really got it. Interactive lecture, of course, is something that's very popular. This is um, the picture on the right is from Carol Faust's class. We did um, an exam review for the final in her class. And um, her class is huge, it's wide. She's way over here in the corner. And there's a block of people that are, you could tell that's the lurking section over in this lower right hand corner over here of the room because they're really far from her. It's kind of dark in that corner. And they could probably just get away from sitting back there and being on their phones all class and no one and you know it would just be impossible to manage them and keep them on track so we did this uh lectures uh this um exam review session she had about 60 questions and we just rapid fired questions for that hour hour and a half class and it was awesome every student in there was just on it the whole time they're fist pumping, they're high-fiving each other, they're asking questions, she's getting data about, you know, she sees all their responses as it's coming in, so she can see who's really confused, she can see which questions she needs to go back and cover, she needs to see where she needs to spend some time, point them to some more resources to get ready for the final. Um, so in an asynchronous environment, you could do the same thing. You could just create an entire block of questions and this is your study guide for your final. And you could point them to certain content, uh, videos or documents, and then also give them questions uh, to use to practice for their exam. This picture on the left is from a different class and this is what the polling looks like from the student perspective. In the asynchronous lessons, they don't see this chart of responses from the poll. Um, but you could, you could still do a poll asynchronously and then show them the, the response chart during your live class. And that might be a nice way to open the class and have um, use that for your class opener, discuss everyone's poll responses, discuss that distribution, and then move on. Uh, you can see in the right-hand side, she's got the notes panel opened up. <clears throat> Excuse me. So she's taking notes over here while she's working. All the Nearpods allow you to narrate the slides. You can narrate whether you, 
excuse me, upload a PowerPoint or create a slide in Nearpod. You have two ways to narrate. Excuse me. Another one of my favorites is flipping the class. Um, it seems like I never had enough time in class that my classes went really fast. I always wanted to do more than I had time with my students. So I flipped my classes. <coughs> and I would have them do independent work before they got to class um, that I didn't want to spend any time on during class. So like Kevin's saying to use to build vocabulary awesome then everybody comes with the vocabulary they need for the class that we're doing that day so they have front loaded information to them and then when they get to class they can spend all that time collaborating working in breakout rooms doing interactive stuff with me on the whiteboard and our whole group and um, i get to spend time with them on all the meaty stuff on all the higher order thinking skills and and I, I feel like I get a lot farther in my um, face time with them. Uh, you can also use it to activate prior knowledge. Uh, so maybe you're trying to make some connections more explicit to them or surface some, some connections that they have to the content that you're going to teach that day. So thinking about how does that relate to something in their life or something they may have had experience with in another class, front load them with that so that they're their heads in the game when they get to the class that day. So those are some quick strategies that don't take a lot of time to implement, don't take a lot of time to manage, and they'll, they'll move learning forward in lots of different ways. Does anyone have any questions so far or any um, discussion points around designing or strategies for class? Good, good. Okay, so I'll stop the share and just invite you to keep interrupting me anytime you have a point to share or a question. We'll go out to the Nearpod dashboard and we can put together a lesson and just look at um, some design. Okay, so. Go ahead and share my Nearpod screen. There we go. Okay, so I have lots of folders with content organized in there. Then I've got some loose lessons down here that I haven't organized yet. These are practice ones that I'll probably just delete off. Um, you can create a folder for your classes, and you can even create subfolders inside your class inside each folder. The way you would create a folder is to hover over the three dots, then click add to. Here's where you can share to the school library. And then here's where you can create your own folder organization. You can add to existing folders or you can create a new folder over here. And then once you do that, it'll take you to that folder with your item in it. So to create a new lesson in Nearpod, I start here. It has a Google slide integration, but I was not a big fan of that uh, functionality over there. And I love Google, I love Google slides, but I didn't love it with Nearpod. So I'm just, right now I'm sticking with using PowerPoints. That might change. You're gonna need to give your lesson a title. It won't, it actually won't let you save and exit out until you give it a title, so. Go ahead and do that. So the 13th, you can add more information, but that's not required. And the only thing your students see is the title. They don't see any of that description text. Okay, so I'm gonna bring in a PowerPoint and I'm gonna open up my finder and drag in 
a PowerPoint. Now, if you're using PowerPoints from the publisher, you might have to cut them in half. You may have to cut them down even smaller than that, or you may have to replace images um, that are in there. A lot of those images from the publisher PowerPoints are high resolution and they're giant files. So um, just be aware that you might, might need to do a little massaging on those before you bring them in here. But um, if you have PowerPoints from the publisher or PowerPoints that you've been using, a great way to um, make your work go a little faster is bring in all that stuff that you've already done. Okay, so this is not the PowerPoint I wanted to upload, but I can get rid of these slides really quickly. They all have an orange frame around them, meaning they're all selected right now. So I can click delete slide. Yep, I'm sure. And now it's just gonna delete them all off for me. Now I can go back and pull the one in that I really wanted to upload. And here we go. It's telling me it's processing over here in the lower right hand corner. While those are processing, let's look at adding a um, Nearpod slide. So a Nearpod slide is gonna have different functionality than the PowerPoint slide. The Nearpod slide is in content and it's right here, the slide. You can change the background. They're kind of limited, not a lot of fancy uh, background. So that's another reason why I like to use the PowerPoint. You have different layouts. You could add an image to the background if you would like. You can change the layout and you have lots of options over here. You could have just one element, a title, uh, two columns. So you can have text and an image or text and a GIF, text and a video, or you can have four elements. And each one of these could contain something different. So each one of these quadrants here could contain text, video, image, and GIF just on this one slide. And then you could narrate on top of it. That would be a lot going on in one place, but just know that you can do, um, you have some flexibility inside here. I'll go back to the, let's do this one. So I'll use this one. You can add your title. You could add some text. Um, and give them a prompt or something. Uh, making this up as I go along. Oh, didn't like that file. I've never seen that image come up. That's interesting. Here we go. You can change the size of the images with this little slider. You can get rid of them over here. You can do a little bit of formatting on the text change the size, change the justification, bullets, numbers, or get rid of it. And then if you would like to narrate your slide, you click audio and then click audio recorder. Now I'm noticing with um, some instructors that up here in their um, URL bar, they'll have, um, uh, their microphone is not enabled for Nearpod and they'll have to go up and enable that. So if you can't get it to record, you're not seeing that option, look at the settings for this uh, website, the Nearpod website in your browser settings. And it's really easy to record. You just click on top of that microphone. You can see that it's picking up your audio. You see the seconds ticking off as you go along. Stop it here. One thing that I noticed is that I inhale before I start speaking on these recordings. So I bring my slider over as far as I can to cut that off. And then I also hear my click when I click on the microphone. So I always bring my slider over and then I, it gives you like an extra second or two at the end and I trim that off. So it gets rid of that dead space at the end. 
you have to save the audio and then save the slide. Um, it's a two-step process on the audio. If you exit out of here without saving the audio, you'll lose your audio recording. If you want to re-record, you just click the bin icon and then re-record. When students, if you allow students to respond uh, orally to the open-ended questions, this is the exact same tool that they see. I'm gonna go ahead and save it and exit out. And now I see that I've got some narration on that slide. I see the narration bar and I see my actual slide that was created. And my other slides have finished uploading. And then here's those big cues to myself. I want the collaborate to be way at the beginning. And I might put it after this prompt. Um, so here, if I, I've got a key to myself to add the collaborate and I can add content three different ways. I can use this add slide and I'll see the content tools and the activity tools menu. This bar is persistent. It's like a frozen uh, header row on a spreadsheet. So if you have lots of slides, as you scroll down, this will always be here. This will always add your slide at the very end and then you'll need to drag it back up. This, this button and this button do the exact same thing. Same content menu, same activities menu. Again, that one will add all the way at the end and you have to drag it back up. I didn't like dragging mine around, so I use a, the third method, which can be a little squirrely, so you've gotta be patient sometimes, but for me, this is the fastest way to build. I click in between slides where I want to insert that content or activity, and I see a horizontal blinky blue line, and then I click add slide, and the kind of slide I want to add is an activity, and I would like to add a collaborate. Down here you've got different formats for your actual board. I always look for the most contrast. Um, so like this one is really hard for me to read, red text on a yellow background. Um, this one has a nicer contrast, but I'm not a fan of yellow for some reason. So I usually go with this one or this dark one over here. And then I could add an image if I would like here as well. So now right here at the beginning of, of the presentation, the students have some action to take and another act and then an engagement trigger. I see the topic line from that collaborate. So I don't see the second line of text, but I see that topic line. So I use that as much as a, a topic line for the students as a cue to myself for um, uh, the, the question that I've added there. Cause I, I know I'm gonna see that little cueing. And if I get 10 collaborates on here, I'll know which what each collaborate addresses. And then I come over here and delete my queuing slide off. So that is a method that helped me um, build along a little bit faster once I got to Nearpod. So I do the bulk of the work over in PowerPoint. And when I get here, I'm just really just adding in the interactivity, maybe reorganizing stuff a little bit, but um, you, know, you just kind of get a feel for what works best for you come down here I wanted to add an interactive video so I'll come in between click add slide now video is a tool that could be content or activity so it could really live in either place and there's also a shortcut on your main dashboard to create um, a video without even going into this section. So if you only wanted to do an interactive video, you could use that shortcut. It's stacked in those tiles with the create the lesson and Nearpod, create with Google Slides, and the third option is create a video. Or you can add it in here. But it lives in content, even though we're gonna add activity to it. 
I think they should have put that in both places, but they didn't. Okay, so I don't have anything in a video library. I do all my linking from YouTube. Whenever I create a, YouTube, a video, I upload it to YouTube. I either make it public or unlisted, collect it in a playlist, and then use the link over here. You can upload a video from your Drive, Dropbox, or OneDrive, but there's a size limit on it. When you upload from YouTube, you won't hit that size limit because it's not an up or you're not uploading from YouTube, you're linking from YouTube. So it just looks at it like a link. So it can be a five hour long video. You would never do that, but it could be a long video, much longer than the videos that you're allowed to upload. So I'm gonna go over and just grab a URL. I come down here to share. Now one, one thing I found out is that if I want to skip a video up, you know, like you can start videos like halfway through, go to the share, and then you've got a timestamp where you could share that link. And when someone clicks the link, it starts them at a certain point, but that doesn't work in Nearpod. It's no matter where you're at on the video, even if I use this and it modified my URL, it still starts them at the very beginning. So um, if it's your own video and you wanted them to start halfway through, you could cut a piece of it off in your, um, either your studio.youtube.com, they've got an editing tool, or you could pull it into another video editor and cut that down for them. So I grabbed the link and I'm gonna come back to Nearpod and it's much, much faster for me to add the link then try to search for videos. If you don't know the exact title, it just, it pulls up a lot of random stuff because there's so many videos on YouTube. So this is the fastest way to go right where I want to go. I still need to click search. It's here, but it's not, but it's not embedded yet. I have to click on top of it to select it. And that's saying that I agree that um, I want to show this video. So I agree that is the video I would like to show. So I'm gonna come down to the lower right hand corner and click save. Now at this point, I could just save and come out if I don't want to add any questions or I could go ahead and start asking questions here. So you can skip this up. So if you know at certain time stamps that you want to ask questions in certain places, you can skip right to that spot or you could just let it play and then pause it when you're ready to ask the question. And then you'll just go ahead and click activity. You can ask an open-ended or a multiple choice. And then here we go. And then I say, um, and then click save. You have a lot of characters. You can write a pretty long question here. Then I could skip it up myself or let it play. I could go back and edit this question. I see my question here. If I'm good to go, I just click save. Uh -oh. I'm missing something in the chat box. Okay, uh, now there's my video and it tells me interactive video. So let's see that I've got the video here. Is anyone planning to use Flipgrid at all with Nearpod? That can be kind of a tricky setup. So I, we, can, we can do that one too. Y'all would like to see that. Uh, no? All right, I'll do it anyway, and that way it'll be on the video. So let's say I want to do like a wrap up at the very end. So I can click past the last slide, or I could use this one. Got my line, going to add slide. Flipgrid is an activity tool, so I'm going to click over here to Flipgrid. Now, while that's opening up, I'm going to come over here to my educator dashboard in Flipgrid and log in. So 
I need to grab two URLs to make that connection work for my students. So this is my teacher dashboard for Flipgrid. I have three groups. Your groups could collect all your grids for your class and you can have tons of topics within each group. So I'll just grab this one. I'm going to click on the name of that group and I have a URL at the top that has the word group in it. I'm going to copy that and that will be the teacher URL. Now you'll see the word grids in their sample here, but they just changed grids to groups on the other page. So if you have that, you just want to remember that you need the group. So first we're telling uh, Nearpod, look in this group and inside that group, I want you to pull this video. And we'll get that URL right there on this share button. So this is the, the join uh, link that you would give to students also. So I copy that, come back over, and that's the student URL. So this is telling it, look in this group, find this topic. And I click add. And it's done its magic. Now there's the flip grid. Are there any other types of um, content or activities that y'all would um, like to go through now that you haven't played with yet? I want to try here first. Now? Okay. So let's look at ways to um, preview your lesson. So you have a few different ways to look at the content. You can first just select one of the slides if you only want to look at one of them. And then come down here to the left of the save and exit button and click preview. Oh, I see stuff in the chat. Let's see, can't think of any. Thank you, Kevin. Once you get the lay of the land, it, it's a really simple, simply laid out tool to use. It's just kind of getting to know where everything is at first, I think is the tricky part. Okay, so now I'm in student preview. Whenever you're previewing as a student from your teacher dashboard here in Nearpod, you see this blue bar across the top. You can practice submitting something. So just, You can see how that works for the student. You can practice throwing them an image. There we go. Click post. So you can test that out. None of this is saved in the student version. So all of this data gets thrown out on any question that you practice yourself. And the little heart, students can click that to show that, oh yeah, I feel happy too. Over here in the upper right-hand corner is the way that you exit out of student preview. The teeny, teeny circle with an X in it, it lights up when you hover over it, and now you're back to your main view. Another way you could view is just to, if you wanted to see the whole thing from beginning to end before you leave your dashboard, you could start back there at the beginning, and then just start clicking through as so you can listen to your audio, there's a collaborate. So if you want to give it a spot check, you can do it that way. And I'll show you a third way to check it. And I, this is the one that I do before I launch. Um, is I come out here and hover over the tile. When you hover over it, all your options for deployment show up and you're, you're, you have more options up here in this menu. I grab the student paste code or link. Usually it's faster just to grab the, the link. And then I'm going to change my share and just put it on my whole desktop for a second. And come back here. And then I open an incognito window. 
And this is the way I test a lot of uh, tech tools because when you open incognito, it doesn't hold your login. So it's, you would have to log in fresh, um, but it gives you a way to check your Nearpod. Oops, I didn't grab that link properly though. Let me go back, copy it again. There we go. And now this is exactly what the student sees when they come in on their uh, phone or tablet. So I ask them to type their name exactly like it shows up on their Blackboard. And if they want to use a nickname, put it in the second line. You see both of these on your report. I don't know about you, but trying to figure out nicknames and names that they're going by that's not the same on Blackboard to record grades is a hassle for me. Okay, so this is the slide that we created in the Nearpod. So it's going to have the accessibility tools attached to it. Um, the PowerPoint slides that you upload do not have the accessibility tools attached. This, however, when I click this, if I have a reading difficulty, I can have Nearpod read this to me. If I don't like a female voice, I can change it to male. If she's talking too slow, I can speed it up. And then it'll highlight the words as it goes along. I can change the contrast here. And there's a translation tool. I can translate it into different languages. I can highlight just parts of it. There's a lot of things you can do here with this. Um, so if uh, Justin Henniker's office contacts you and says, you know, you've got a student with reading disabilities, um, you can think about uh, how to make your presentations accessible for that person. Um, I have dyslexia and I listen to a lot of audiobooks. It wasn't until like maybe two months ago I found out that there's actually a font. Um, and I found that on my library app that is made for dyslexic people that weights the letters in a way that just makes it so much easier to read. They don't have that option here. So I'm um, having some audio for uh, readers that have um, reading issues can be a great help for them. Um, over here on the right hand side is where the notes tool is accessed. So you can actually send some notes to yourself in practice mode just to see what that looks like. I always set it up via email. That's the easiest way for me to find it. Um, it doesn't get lost in my Google Drive. So I'm an old lady. I email stuff to myself. And then my email's down here so I can see if I've made a mistake on my email address and then I could edit that to get that corrected. Even if I don't wanna type any notes, now I'm gonna get this whole presentation when I exit out. They also have the notes navigator down below and they can skip between questions. When you do live sessions in class, they cannot skip, you control it. Um, but when they log in in a self-paced mode, you're going to uh, control their pace back and forth, or they're gonna control their pace back and forth, either by hopping through the navigator or clicking these arrows. So then Heather, for like your class, um, if you're doing it live, you could launch the lesson live from your screen and then have them join that live lesson and then you're controlling the pace of the questions. They're not skipping all over the place. You're still in control of where the class is at every point. So that might be um, the best way for you to share that with students in a live class. So then you can just go through the whole thing, see what uh, the presentation looks like test out your interactive video, test out your different questions that you add. Sometimes it, you know, I have a little trouble with reading sometimes. And so I'll look at it, I'll it on the Nearpod dashboard, it looks totally fine, but then I come out here and I catch uh, little things that I need to correct. So that's nice here. Um, let's see if it will, um, there we go. That's where the question is. So let's skip. I'll just get past it. it. Won't let me move now. So when they hit, they'll play along, and as soon as they hit that question uh, point, they can't do anything else. Question pops up, covers up half the video. They type their response. Um, there's my response. Click submit. Okay, lock my answer in. Let's go. 
and then we can just keep moving forward. When students get to the very end, they just exit out. But I tell them go the, all the way to the end until you see the very ending screen. And then go ahead and just close out the tab. The different ways to deploy this, I'm gonna stop the share and then narrow it back down to the single browser window. So when you're ready to add it to Blackboard, you've got your Blackboard lesson connection. If um, students are using a small device, they're going to need to use a code. So here, like Heather, we'll do a live class and then a self-paced class. So for live, um, this Zoom integration is not fantastic. Uh, we enabled it on my account so that I could test it and literally all it does is open a Zoom room, which I can do myself. So I thought, oh, it's gonna open this lesson in Zoom for me or do some kind of, make it easier for students to work in Zoom and Nearpod. It doesn't do anything like that that I can tell from playing with it so far. So for right now, I suggest is forgetting that's even there. But for um, a synchronous class where you control the pace, click live presentation, and then give your students this code. It still says make it a Zoom meeting. It just didn't, and we're in a Zoom, so I don't want to do that. I'll get a video out if I figure out that there's a way to make this more fun, but I didn't see any benefit to using the Zoom connection so far. So here you can just tell students, uh, if they're, even if they're on a computer, uh, they could go to, if they're on a computer, they'll go to nearpod.com login, and then on the right hand side of that page, there's a place for them. Oh, I'm already logged in. Heck. Uh, it'll split the page and it'll have a teacher login on one side and an enter with a code on the other side. So you just tell them to enter with the code on that side. Um, you could drop the link into the chat box, but then they would have to transfer that to their phone. So that's probably not as easy. So code is probably the best way for them to join during a live session. Then when you're running the session, that code is persistent up here. So if somebody's like, wait, I didn't get in. Relax, it, here it is. So they can still get in. You're gonna control the pace. So as you advance the slide, it automatically advances on their view as well. They have their uh, control uh, buttons on the left and right are not there. They don't work for them. So um, this feature down here, hide student names and show student names is a way that you can um, share responses that are coming in without um, anyone else seeing them. What's gonna be tricky in a live Zoom is this is what's gonna be projected on their Zoom. So when we're in live face-to-face -face classes, I recommend, and this is the way we've been doing every live face-to-face -face class, when you log in on the lectern, log in using the student join code and let that run just like the student view. That way students see uh, the device in their hand looks exactly like the presentation on screen. Then you log in on a separate device to run the Nearpod. So you might wanna mirror that here and I can play with that with you even just to see how this uh, works best for you and your teaching style. But what I would probably do is run my Nearpod on a second device and then uh, log in during my Zoom session as a student so that what they see on the Zoom screen matches what's in their hand. It, Nearpod does have a student view up here that you can change to student view, but during a live session, you won't be able to review responses with students' names and then share them out. You could review responses anonymously and then share them out if you like. So it's just kind of some stuff to play with. So now we're in the student view and I know that because I can go back to teacher view from here. Um, but this is exactly how students would see it. So now I'm back. In my teacher view, I'm still in the live session. To get out of that, you click this little arrow in the top left corner. Yes, I would like to leave. So for launching self-paced lessons, 
students who will complete this, who come into Blackboard on a phone or a tablet, will still need the code. So you can uh, add your lesson in Blackboard as a live lesson or a self-paced lesson. But um, any student who's on a small device still needs the lesson code from the student paste. So um, I'm here in student paste lesson. I can use, I can share this one that's already been generated. If I want to separate my data and keep different class periods separate from the same Nearpod, I'll launch a new one. And this generates a completely new code, a completely new URL, and a completely new report in my report section. I see that I have require student submissions turned on. I have that turned on by default in my lesson settings on my dashboard, but I can override that here. I leave that on to help students get all of their effort credit. So I'm like, you need to complete 100% of the questions and this won't let them leave until they do that. I can change the number of days that this is active. So if I only want them to be able to work on this for a week, I can restrain that to a week, or I can move it out using the arrow up here next to the, sec the month on the right-hand side, all the way up to a year. So you have a lot of flexibility with the amount of time it'll be available, and then you just click your ending date. Click apply, tells me how long I've got it active for. I can share this join code. So on my Blackboard, I like to have um, the join code for a small, small device and then the embedded lesson or the link below it. And that kind of covers all the bases with students um, getting into the Nearpod. So that, that's the couple of different ways to launch it, live or self-paced. You can go back in and edit. You can preview from here as well. Any questions on launching the lesson or managing it during your sessions? And again, I'll have a direction sheet in your uh, resources from the session today that you can share with students. You can edit it any way you like. Okay, would y'all like to look at some data? Let's look at reports really quick. So, it went fast. Um, this reports link on the left-hand side shows me the report for every Nearpod I've ever launched. Um, I can hover over my particular Nearpod in my library to get the report for that single Nearpod if I would like. So I could come up here to my three dots and then go to reports, and then I'm only looking at the report for this Nearpod. I usually just come out here, and I look for the report that I would like to download, and here. When I click on top of it, Right below, I see all the sessions that have ever been launched for that Nearpod and how many students participated. So I launched this once on the 24th at 7 p.m., tested it, figured out I had some more work to do, launched it again the next day, um, did, made my edits, had a look at it, it looked good. So then I went ahead and launched it for my course. So that's why I have three different reports. These only have one person in it. That was me testing it. To get into the report, you just click here or click here on the title. In your um, session materials, there will be um, some sample reports and I'll open those up really quickly just to show you what you'll see. So open them all. And you can get CSVs or PDFs. I download both. Or I download the one that I need depending on what I'm going to do with the data. Okay. Let's see. I'm a finder. So let's 
start with a whole class report. The download is a CSV. Uh, you need to do a little massaging to make the data readable. You know, CSVs don't have any formatting. There we go. Come on, slowly. There it is. Okay. So I blinked out all the names on this report, but you would see in this first column the name they enter in the first row or their pre populated Blackboard name shows here. Other is the nickname. Date is the day I launched it. Join date is the day that they completed this activity. So what I usually do, you know, I can sort by, um, sort it by completion date. If I have a, an activity that's open for a long time and I'm grading every couple of days, um, then I'll sort by completion date. And I remember the last time I, I checked this report was on the 4th. So who's done any work since the 4th? I know that those are the folks that um, I need to go over to Blackboard and enter their effort score on. Or I sort by participation and descending order to see who's completed 100% of that activity. Now, uh, sometimes folks miss like, students will miss like one collaborate or one question and um, you know, it'll, for here, that was a third of the activities. So I, I kind of give it some wiggle room in my grading when they're very new at it. It just depends on like how you're, how you're structuring it. I might go back and say, hey, you need to redo it. You missed one of the questions, that kind of thing. But um, you see everything here. Then you see all their responses, and this is just too messy for me to try to read. So that's when I go to the PDF. I'll open that one next. The PDF is nice, a uh, nice way to look at their responses. Oh my gosh, I thought I deleted names off here. Um, okay, so I see how many students completed participation on the quizzes, how did they do? See their participation score here. And then there's a lot of people that have worked through this stuff so far, so that's a couple of pages long. For the collaborate boards, you click here on class board and it opens up an HTML, HTML file that shows you the board. So you'll see everyone's responses. You see, oh, we've got some hearts over here. Three people like this response. Three people like this one. On your teacher dashboard, you can sort these to show by number of likes and by number ordered. And you can also moderate them during live sessions. So, um, you know, some instructors would, would say, oh, I only want the correct answers to show up. So I'm going to moderate it and delete off anything that's incorrect. I like to show incorrect answers and then try to have a discussion around that to help the students tease out which answers are accurate, which ones could be um, changed to become accurate. How would you reword this to make it a, a complete answer, that kind of thing. Um, so that's what the collaborate board looks like Oops, on the report. And then as you go down, this might be um, helpful to you, Kevin, um, on the matching pairs, you see um, how many matches you have. So I have four on this question. There's four matches. If it takes them more than four tries, I know they had trouble. And then it tells me if they completed that activity or not. So um, this person had trouble, but they just went out. They didn't click again until they got them all right. So you can use this data as uh, cues to persistence cues to accuracy, um, you know, there's sloppy mistakes and then there's, you know, honest mistakes. So uh, you get to know your students and kind of who, ma who makes which kind of mistake. But this also helps me see, man, if everyone, if it took everyone a lot of tries to do the matching on this particular question, then they're having trouble with this vocabulary term or matching this concept. Um, so that gives me good data as a teacher about what I need to loop back around with. This is a poll question. Here's the poll question that I answered, or that I asked, and then here's everyone's selection. So I see their names. 
what they selected and I see the overall distribution over here. So if you ask a poll in a self-paced activity, which this is a self-paced activity, I would cut and paste this image right here on the far right. Um, it's not showing the whole response. I'd have to probably massage that a little bit, but this would be a way to share out the poll results at the beginning of the next class and use this as maybe a jumping off point for that day. And here's an open-ended question. And I see their whole response here on that open-ended question, which is nice. You get a lot of, when you use open-ended questions, you'll get a lot of thinking and opinions that you would not get verbally out loud in class. Um, one of the best pieces of student feedback that we got that happened more from more than one student was, I feel like my voice is heard. And so these are probably students that are not speaking up in class. They're not raising their hand. Um, sometimes we don't call on people unless they raise their hand. And so they never get the opportunity to share because they're never asked to share and they're not voluntarily doing it. So it's been really nice. Um, some instructors have, you know, some students have shared some really personal things going on too. And it's just been a great communication tool to have um, with students and then with the learner to learner collaborations like this activity here. Those two reports that you get for um, your whole class, you can also download for individual students. So if an individual student ever has, um, you know, a dispute about a submission that they did or I did it all, well, here's your individual report. You missed one of the questions um, or something like that. So um, you do have the ability to share individual reports with students as well. Trying to think of any last minute tips and tricks. You'll come, you'll just come to a lot of things playing with this. Um, school library, definitely visit the school library. Please, please, please share in here. Um, it helps uh, give other instructors inspiration um, across the departments. Uh, the EXHP has a lot of different question types in there. If you'd like to see those, they used matching, they used fill in the blanks. Uh, Shauna Hannenberg did some interesting activities where she had students break down food labels and do the math on the food label in an open-ended question. And then they could, everyone shared out that response. Um, there's Rachel um, Zimmerman used video, but that was before the interactive video was developed here. So she's probably gonna be really excited about that. Um, you can see an example of like an orientation. So library is using Nearpod to do orientations. Um, for students and they're also using these on their website. So it's a good way to communicate information to students. Um, I know a lot of folks do like the annotate the syllabus activity. You could also have them read the syllabus here and then you could give them a syllabus quiz if you wanted to do a quiz instead of having them annotate it. Um, so you can come through here and just have a look. This AT has some interesting um, stuff in it. Um, uh, you'll probably learn a lot. It's about uh, animal bites. Um, can be kind of graphic. I should put a not safe for work maybe on there <laughs> to warn people. But um, So there's some good examples and I encourage you to share too. Uh, down here in Professor Resources, that jumps you out to their help page. And this chat bubble I use often. Um, I used to only be able to get it to work in um, Google Chrome, someone told me they got it to work in Firefox. So it should be working in Firefox now. But uh, what's cool about this is I can see all the questions I ever asked. So if I asked a question a way long time ago, which I started asking questions back in the spring, um, I can go back and say, oh yeah, that's, that's the way I do that thing, or that's the way you perform that task. So they're pretty helpful. Um, I'm around too, always. Uh, to help with your lessons, um, happy to uh, review them, give you any kind of feedback you'd like. Um, uh, um, help you with ideas, help you match strategies, tools, anything I can do like that to be of help. Um, 
think that's all I have for y'all. We've got about nine minutes left. Is there anything that I could show you or anything you'd like to test out here while we're all together? Feeling all right? I can't think of anything. I think I just need to start it and then I'll probably have more questions or yeah. Yeah. A good primer, but I think until we get into it or I get into it, I, I, I won't have questions. Okay. Thank you. Or at least I played with it. I played with it a little with you. And so I have a couple of real basic assignments, so I'm ready to go more on it, but somehow I got logged out now. So I got to figure that out. So again. There's a forgot password link on that login page. Click that and you should get it. It takes it about 10 minutes, I think. If you don't get it, let me know and I can reset it again. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Got to go um, deal with flooding basement. Oh, that doesn't sound good. Not a big deal. Bye, oh, guys. Good. All right. Bye bye. All right. Well, we can go ahead and break now. And uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you for trying Nearpod. I'm uh, super interested to hear like how it goes, how your students like it. So keep me posted and um, I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dorothy.